Alicia is uh, involved in Mindwell. Um, if anyone came to the first um, the first uh, technical meetup, you would have seen that Alicia handed out some of these Mindwell cards on the, on the chairs. Um, and we went to back just to, to talk a little bit more about what Mindwell is because it's such an amazing resource. Um, Mindwell is a mental health website for people in Leeds, funded by NHS Leeds Clinical Commission Group. It brings together information from the NHS in Leeds, Leeds City Council and the third sector into one single go-to place. Mindwell won the Leeds Digital Festival 2019 Tech Award woo, uh, earlier this year. And, um, today we work with Alicia, and uh, so Alicia is Deputy Director of M Habitat, uh, but also the Mindwell Lead. Uh, Mrs. Mindwell, yeah? Uh, along with uh, Chris Hall, who's a local sport hero, and they're going to share their experiences. So, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so yeah, my, so I don't need to tell you what mind well is really now you all know. <laughs> 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 Thanks. 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 Um, okay, yeah, so um I'm trying to think how many years ago it was now, four years ago, four and a half years ago. Um the commissioners decided that instead of doing what we often do, which is employ people to help people find information through our different websites. Honestly, I'm just not. Um, we, we thought we'd sort it out and do it properly. So they gave us the blank sheets of paper, a developer, a, <coughs> a dev company, um, and told us that we needed, whatever we built, we had to have 5,000 hits a month. And that was it. Go forth and create. <coughs> I'm an occupational therapist. I've never built anything digital in my life. So it was a learning curve, a fairly steep learning curve. Um, and actually, what has blown me away, and still blows me away every single day that we're running Mindful now, is how amazing the people of Leeds are. We just went out to people, and we, we used the, what you would expect, we used the GDS process. We use service improvement methodologies, we did the research, we created a persona. We did all that work and people came and they came and they came and they, they challenged us and they came up with brilliant ideas. And what we have today, all these years later, is a website which has been built around three user journeys, which wasn't our idea, somebody else came up with that idea. It's won five awards. We are still on non-recurrent funding, <laughs> so every year, even though it's bedded into urgent care pathways, it is part of the mental health offering in the city, we still have to get funding every single year. This year we've got slightly luckier, we've got money until March 2021, but there is still no business model for how you do this when it sits across organisations. So although M Habitat is technically a part of the Mental Health Trust, we operate as a trading arm. So we self fund, we work nationally, and we work with everybody. But we run Mindwell as a passion. <laughs> um, it, we have a team of, of people in M Habitat who manage different bits of it. We have another bit of team who are in the third sector. And um, for those of you that are aware of Forum Central, so uh, there's a mental health network called Volition, which has been around for a long time in Leeds. Um, and they're part of an overarching body called Forum Central. So they um, are networked into other organisations, so working with learning disabilities, older people, um, there's a sensory uh, network, there's all sorts of organisations at Forum Central. So every Monday morning we have an ops meeting, everybody comes over from Forum Central, and we all hang out on the mezzanine here, for those of you who know the building, with coffee, plenty of coffee. And we basically go through everything. So we run all the tech stuff, we do all the de graphic design, we do all the development work, we try and sort out the accessibility stuff. And then what happens is, you get an email saying, we've changed the access route for this referral. Uh, it starts on Monday, and we're going, what? So Mindful is just not, people don't understand that you can't just change the website 
by you know going on a tab and changing a number that this is a digital service that we provide to the whole system our website is is bedded in literally digi digitally bedded in across as many organizations as we can encourage to do that so it's on people's intranets so that if you're a member of staff <coughs> in your own city you can access it if you need it um, and that's the philosophy we've had really is to bed it in digitally we have no marketing budget and I think, I think, I think the week we got the Tech for Good uh, award at Leeds Digital Festival, which we were absolutely convinced we weren't going to get because shift we were up against Shift MS and people like that who are amazing. Um, so we nearly fell over and we were extremely giddy. Um, but we hit 150,000 um, unique users that week. We're well over that now. Um, and it, we're just, we've just been blown away by the city's response to this. It's the first time we've ever had one site for, for anything like this. We decommissioned mine, the mental health charity, had an information site. We decommissioned it, closed it, um, so that it was simpler for people to find things. So hence the passion about finding cards on your seats and me popping up everywhere talking about it. Um, it's, a, it's a passion to us to try and get this deep into the communities in need. Um, you know, we, we go around, we talk to all sorts of people, you'll find us in the market, and um, we've, we've done things with uh, Empower, who had all sorts of stresses. Uh, we've done stuff with NHS Digital because they've been, I don't know if those of you that have connections into NHS Digital, but they're going through waves of redesign. Um, which means that lots of people are losing their jobs or having to apply for their jobs. It's a really super stressful time. So we've created a whole uh, pack of em employer information, which is have to go through legal people and everything for the full council to sign off. Um, but we now have all those sort of resources. We have close links with the Mindful Employer Network in Leeds. And we would encourage any of you that have got bigger organisations definitely to investigate becoming a member of the Mindful Employer Network and supporting people's well-being. So we're really passionate about it. Um, and a few weeks ago, I was invited to go to a rugby club. And not to watch the rugby, um, but to have a Mindful stall and talk to the, anybody really who would listen to me about Mindful. And there, I heard the most moving presentation that I probably heard in years, really, um, from State of Mind, and uh, met Chris Hall, and was very privileged to hear their stories about um, about their own experience. So, um, the other guy was called Ian Smith. Ian Smith. So he was the rugby league um, referee, and um, his story was just quite shocking really but um, so I invited Chris to come and just and talk about state of mind if he wants to I don't know if you've got a minute to mention that we're, we're up against it time wise I think um, but to, to hear somebody's journey um, like Chris's was just really mind blowing to me and, and so we're really delighted that Chris has come to share that story with you tonight um, but we've, we've, one of the things we need in Leeds is organisations that support men's well, mental well-being. It's a really tough area, and State of Mind are using sport and stories around sporting legends to help get people talking to each other. So I'm going to pass over to Chris with no further ado. Um, he's just going to spend a few minutes just chatting through uh, about his story. So much. It's uh, an honour to be here, and uh, I got back. Well, you can draw some inspiration from my story. I will apologise because I'm very nervous. I've been just waiting around there, it hasn't helped a little bit. I will go red, and I am a broad Yorkshireman, and unfortunately, my translator has fallen in sick tonight. So, <laughs> so, who am I? So, my name's Chris Hall, and I'm an ex-professional rugby league player. Now, I played three teams over a 10 year period. Um, my career subsequently came to an abrupt end back in March 2012 now after suffering a life threatening brain injury. So I'm gonna give you a little insight to my journey. So, so I was introduced to rugby league 
uh, at the young age of seven by my father. And for me, uh, from that first moment really, I was instantly hooked and that was the lifestyle I wanted to lead. I wanted to be an outright professional rugby league player. I started playing at the age of 11 and within a few years, by the time I did 14, I had uh, interest from several good clubs at the time and uh, was fortunate enough to sign for the team that I grew up watching, being Castle for Tigers. I spent the best part of four years there before moving across the other side of town to Wakefield, then the Wakefield Wildcats, and then I had a year at Dewsbury, uh, and then I had a short spell back at Castleford. I was privileged and honoured to, to play on and represent Wakefield and Castleford on Sky, uh, and play under a professional club in Dewsbury in the Challenge Cup, which is the biggest cup in the league history. Um, so, I'll tell you a little bit about what happened to me now. So, Back in March 2012, uh, seemingly what was a pre-season friendly, I think two teams trying to stay to cement the place of the team to look out for, you know, to watch the beat for the season. Uh, I was involved in two altercations which forced me to leave the field in protest. Now, within half an hour of leaving that field, I began seizuring, fitting and I collapsed to the floor. It's quite an emotional time for me, this but bear with me. So, I was rushed to hospital, with what was at the time just a suspected broken jaw, just probably a routine thing. I went over to Pinderfield and um, they wanted to do a CT scan, uh, you know, to see if there were any sort of more extensive injuries than just a jaw around the neck area. And they were struggling to settle me down and they didn't want to pin me down to prevent, you know, they didn't want to cause any further damage. So they called in uh, my mum to see if she could work a charm. And uh, she had no joy. And then moments later, after sending her away, I, I began screaming out with this unbearable pain in my head. And I soon began to realise the severity of my injury was far worse and that I'd actually got this really bad head injury. So they rushed me over to the LGI here at Leeds, um, taking great risks. They induced me into a coma in that ambulance. Um, and the nursing staff, uh, the doctors, etc. They'd all set up promptly to uh, operate with immediate effect on my arrival. So basically, I've got a subdural hematoma, which in layman's terms is a, blood, a bleed and a blood clot on the brain. So my head was, was literally out here with the internal bleeding, about three and a half inches of internal bleeding, my head was a balloon. So what I'm going to do, this is new to me, so this is a, a Terrible selfie, but we've all got one if we've been to the gym. <laughs> I've dropped my head off because it's right anyway. So that's kind of the stature I was prior, well, while I was playing. And then from that, then this is the this is after the operation, obviously. But you can see there, hence the reason that when they went with the broken jaw, and then obviously as the uh, internal bleeding escalated, the sun began to realise it was far worse. So that to cut me from the front of my head, all the way around, and around back here, just by my ear, um, to drain the blood and, and relieve the pressure. I had a total of 48 staples to hold the wound back together. Now, believe it or not, so there before you're actually dying twice on the operating table, and my parents, after the operation, were told the next few days were crucial. They probably had about 20% chance of making it through, so, you know, I keep myself every day to think what I put my parents through, but again, it's not my fault and they don't blame me, I'm sure. So, as I woke up in hospital after spending several days in intensive care, I wasn't prepared to accept the extent of injuries. You know, I'd gone from sort of one day running around the rugby field doing what I dearly loved, to in my next life day, waking up staring at these roof tiles, and I'd suffered paralysis and loss of speech, uh, which is unusual for me. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, um, yeah, bear with me. So, I had to, oh, well, sorry. So once I got out of intensive care, gone onto the ward, uh, and once I was finally able to go home, you'd think that was quite a, a warming time for me, you know, everyone wants to get home and they don't like being in hospital. But I was actually, I think when really, uh, a real deep depression started to kick, kick in for me, because not only had I been told in hospital I'd never play rugby league again, I devoted my life to it, I was really passionate about it, that's all I ever knew. You know, uh, I spent nearly every day with me 
you know, my best mates, more than my own family and friends in, in my 30, 30 team mates. And uh, I had to learn to walk, talk, brush my teeth again, to do with me, but wipe my own backside. I think all those things, you know, day to day things that we take for granted now, you know, as if it wasn't hard enough realising that I was never going to play in the league again. But the thing, well, for me, um, what really kept the depression in what my brain knew all these things, it, it, it knew what it needed to do, you know, to pick that tooth, brush your toothpaste up, you know, blah, 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 blah. It knew what to do, but my uh, body wouldn't follow suit. So I went on the slippery slope, and uh, then one particular day, um, fortunate being a player like you, and it's just a shame he's not here really tonight, but as a referee, he doesn't make much friends, but I had thousands, fortunately, throughout the playing career. They all sort of grouped together and they sat me down one day and they just said, come on, we can beat this. I want you to tell me exactly how you feel, what's going through your head, you know, sort of speak out about your problems and your struggles, take that weight off your shoulders and, you know, get that release of your chest. So I did, uh, and I've never felt better. And so from that day forward, um, that's when things really started moving on. Just another little one there for you, that's my little dog. She was a massive part of my recovery, she just sort of, she just was always there in my corner, you know what I mean? She always had me back in there. So yeah, I just thought I'd sneak that one in there. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so this is right, we're gonna beat this. So through that uh, positivity that I'd slowly started to gain, then I decided to get back into the gym. Because that was normality for me, and I think that was massive to get some element of normality back from the life I used to lead. But then this one particular day, I was actually having a, a bit of a low self-esteem day, confidence was low, you know, granted and probably understandable. And uh, I just thought, do you know what? Through all this positivity I've obtained, speaking out openly about problems and struggles, and just getting that way off my chest and off my shoulders and everything, I thought, right, I'm gonna do a goal board. And I call this my motivational board. Now, the idea for me, being simple with this, this was, you know, to most people it's metal and four wheels, but it doesn't have to be a car, you know, I'll get that in, I'm not, anyway, I'm not working for this particular car company, but uh, <laughs> I just thought, the idea is simple, I'll do this motivational board, so I took pictures, different angles, different colours, I pinned them all on this board and it was smack bang at the end of my bed, in full view, on top of a chest of drawers, and for me it was simple. You lay in bed, that's the first thing you see in the morning, last thing you see at night, and that's all you'll ever see is the picture. If you don't get yourself out of bed, you don't get yourself motivated, you don't keep on that road to recovery. Now, one particular day again, I decided to raise the bar and said, in two years I'm going to get myself one of these. I never really had a nice car, despite me and sporting background, but then when I played, money wasn't the, the really big thing as it is now, you know. But uh, two years and three months later, boom. You know, I got one, I did it. You know, so that's testament to anyone that if you put your mind to anything, despite faced with any sort of adversity, you know, there's only you telling yourself you can't, you can't do something. So, yeah, so that was that really. And uh, so, despite the lengths and depths as to how far I've come, you know, I stood here before you, poker face, having a great deal of pain, asking for your sympathy and all with my shoulder, my back, my neck, my legs, you know, I have, you know, I'm not afraid to say about other issues and things I'm really sensitive to light, I suffer with headaches, you know, all that sort of pushed aside and left on the shelf. So I'm just being honest and not being afraid to say, you know, at some point in his life we will need help. And if you ask for it in the right way, you know, in the correct way, you get offered it in, in spades, lucky lots. You know, so it's my advice sort of really to any of you in here, you know, be it is a group of friends, a family unit, or even yourself, you know, you yourself can, you know, potentially save, rebuild, or even change somebody's life. And I'm just going to go on now, if we've got time. Yep, I'm going to go on now. So this is when I got my first sort of purpose in life. If you can imagine, uh, come from a professional rugby player to being laid in a, a bed at home. <coughs> You know, that was, I felt lost. Um, and this gave me my real sense of purpose. So currently, as uh, Alicia mentioned, 
when I go around schools and universities, we deliver, deliver mental health sessions, um, and, and and it's absolutely fantastic, you know. And I am hoping to pursue a career in mental health uh, and do such thing as this be here tonight. Now this this is quite um, uh, this 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 typifies really what I said about you can do anything you want to. Because I'm sure you've all got great ideas, but. I was told I'd never play rugby league again. Now, six years on from then, this is a little rugby league come over to the UK. It had been in Australia for eight years previous. It come to the UK, I got the call, will you come training, will you come and play for us? That was one week. Within the next week, I'm at the Hallowell John Stadium in front of a massive crowd, getting there, passed on the captain's shirt for the Leeds Rhinos Physical Disability Rugby League team to then that's me holding the trophy. I actually, believe it or not, I scored the first ever try in that game, creating history. And that was in front of 1,500 people at Warrington. We actually beat Warrington 22 10. That's the guys there. You know, we've got, we've got people like war veterans with 20% vision, and we've got people with loss of limbs, etc., etc. And then this is what I can only do now. So, this is the Rugby League All Star. So, I play with sort of my idol and some really big legends. Uh, if any of you follow rugby, you know, look this up, the Rugby League All-Stars. We raise money for life for a kid. So that can be raising anything from uh, a weighted blanket so a kid can get a good night's sleep, walking aids, um, even the sensory stuff um, in the Life for a Kid Centre. Uh, again, that's my ugly mop. This is a shameful selfie. This was actually from the apartments <laughs> over there. I didn't approach the kids. Now, for Rugrats Rugby, on a morning, I, I teach two or four year olds, four or seven year olds. That's me living the family life. But I never thought I'd live if you could uh, lead or, or experience. I always wanted to settle down and have done so. Interviewed by the Woods BBC Rugby League Sport. That's breaking the uh, Guinness, broke, breaking the record for the most people in the mental health lesson and winning the Guinness World Book of Records. Hospital Radio commentating. Unsung Heroes Award, that was for my work with the Disability Rugby League and uh, the State my work that I do. That's as VIP at Wembley. Which <laughs> is beautiful. <laughs> That's me. I want to about her in the back row. <laughs> and that's me on Rugby AM. And thanks very much.